Crossroads Media. What is going on, everyone? The Sixers annihilate in the second half, specifically the Houston Rockets, who absolutely suck. We're going to talk about it. First, I want to thank everybody who listened to 97.5 on Monday afternoon, 2 to 6. I filled in for Mikey Miss on NBC Sports Philadelphia, as well as it simulcasted, and the reaction was awesome. I can't thank everybody enough for the support and how much they enjoyed the show. Uh, thank you guys so much for the kind words. I really can't stress it enough. You guys are the best. If you are new to the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit that thumbs up button as well. I greatly appreciate it. If you're looking to buy tickets to go to any Sixers or NBA games in general, NHL, NFL games, Eagles in the postseason, which obviously they won't be hosting a playoff game, but I digress. SeatGeek promo code BRODES at the checkout page will get you $20 off. It's a no-brainer. Get yourself to a game today and then lastly TikTok Broads Media we're having fun hit the follow button there with that being said enjoy the show what is going on everyone welcome on into sports talk with Broads well we know the Houston Rockets are a dumpster fire of a team right now they got guys saying screw it I don't give a damn anymore walking out on their teammates and whatnot pulling in Antonio Brown if you will so the Sixers put up 133 points and kicked their asses out of Philadelphia and it's not as if it was the smoothest game in the world but the outcome was annihilation and that's what matters at the end of the day the first half was putrid you could look at some of the numbers offensively and it wouldn't really dictate the style of flow because the problem was defensively they were getting annihilated. Now Seth Curry in the first half struggled on both sides of the floor but as a team it was pretty brutal. The perimeter defense the unit was a disgrace. Now a lot of that plays a role. One, we know Ben Simmons isn't here and that's something that he excels at. And then two, when you lose Matisse Thibel, now it's really problematic because who's gonna, who's gonna step up and do that role right now so you miss those two guys yeah it makes a lot of sense that it was as embarrassing in that department as it was and you would think well against this team it shouldn't really matter and sure but you know they kept the pace up offensively that third quarter scoring over 40 plus points they just put them away thanks to Joel Embiid with his third triple double he just keeps adding more and more to his game when he plays somehow I'm more enamored than I was the night before which makes no sense because you would think at this point he already does so much at such a high level, yet it works even more and more and more. Excuse me. He continues to work more and more and more. And wow, unreal. He's grabbing rebounds and he's pushing the pace of the entire team where he's driving the lane, basically running point center and then kicking it off to a teammate who lays it up. I mean, his game in transition, people want the big man to go back to just being a back to the basket player. It cracks me the hell up. Cracks me up. He finished with 31, 15, and 10 assists in what, 30 minutes or so? Now, when he had nine assists and he knew he needed one more to go to land that milestone, you could tell that he's trying to look for the pass, find it. Furcon, please shoot. Passes it to Seth Curry. Seth, please take a shot. Now, eventually, he pulls a pump fake, steps into the three-point line. Or, excuse me, he was at the three-point line. Pump fakes, steps inside, so it was a two-pointer. Decently far two-point mid-range J, but he knocked it down, and then, of course, the fans erupted. Speaking of the fans erupting, they definitely targeted someone by the name of Tobias Harris, and Dan Burke mentioned it after the game. Joel Embiid mentioned it after the game, and Tobias Harris is normally one of those guys where you don't see too much emotion pour out of him, but you could tell that he was fired up and disgusted with the way that the fans were treating him, and uh, to be honest with you, like he's a good guy, and I think that's something that we consistently say about him, which feels different, like, it feels different when you're speaking about somebody who you know isn't an asshole, right? He's not a douchebag. He's not a terrible human being. If anything, he's the complete opposite. So when people fail who you respect and who you look at as, you know, someone that you would want your kids to look up to, like Tobias has that type of personality where he's a very respectful individual. He goes about his business the right way. He's a good human being with a good heart. But when they fail and you get on them, there's like a different person 
persona around it, but here's reality of the situation. You haven't been good enough at all this season, and this is what happens, and I don't believe the fans are wrong for letting him know because he took note of this. I look at it as this pretty much describes how this is going to be, and rightfully so. When he's missing shots and he's putting his hands up, somewhat egging on the crowd, Okay, but then when you make your shot, we're cheering and we're giving you your love and we're giving you your praise, maybe a bit sarcastically, but the point is when you do well, you'll get your cheers and when you do piss poor, you'll get your boos. This isn't related to just one person. Nobody's pointing out and targeting Tobias Harris just to do it. You dictate this. You change the way that we feel. You, you playing the game of basketball at a higher rate is what really has us react. We just react, right? We're just making sounds and ooing and eyeing or booing or cheering based off of what you do. So at the end of the day, this is a controllable. You control it, Tobias Harris. I don't know if he believes that he's in a different territory and he's in a different tier that doesn't deserve that level of criticism. But at the end of the day, you're not holding your end up of the bargain. And it's not as if he's playing okay and people are expecting more from him and demanding him to be something that's elite and special. You're barely serviceable at this point. So I think once you play that poorly for this long of a stretch, then it's very fair. You want to say he sucks. You want to say he's poor and piss poor. You know, I've been stressing this for a while now. He's not as bad as what he's showing. He's not worth the money, and we know that. But you're barely even serviceable now. Like, that is so far down the unacceptable level where I don't know how you... And I'm not saying it's easy, right? I'm sure it's very difficult to be trying your best to play better, and you failing and falling flat on your face, and then your hometown team is letting you know you blow and you suck right now and you've been horrendous for a significant amount of time so I'm sure it's not easy if we put himself in his shoes I mean I'm going to be a thousand percent honest I wouldn't love it and I'd probably have a tough time holding back my emotions because I'm an emotional guy but if you're Tobias Harris you got to look in the mirror and say there's two ways to go about this you fight the crowd back which never seems to work out in your favor unless you're Joel and beat some guys are so damn unbelievable that they can take shots at the fans and play that game because they can back it up and support it. Joel Embiid is one of those and it's very rare to be. Let's look at the Sixers as an example. Danny Green will never recover from those dumbass statements that he made in the past. Ben Simmons is a child and he's afraid to just play the sport of basketball in general and apparently Tom Moore who covers the Sixers for the Bucks County Carrier Times reported before the game began that he was hearing rumblings that Ben Simmons was in, in the building, if you will. Nobody knows why, and I haven't seen any other reports but his, but just something fascinating and a bit of an eyebrow raise. But playing this two-man game, if you will, that's not what this is. That's a terrible way to describe it. But playing this back-and-forth game between the fans and you, I think that's a horrible idea to do, and that's a recipe for disaster. So you just kind of have to uh, look past it and move forward. Now, since I mentioned Dan Burke and Joel Embiid, I'm curious if Tobias Harris is even going to, if he even speaks today. It looks like here Dan Burke said that they talked about Tobias' frustration with the crowd at halftime, emphasized blocking out the noise. He presses so hard on himself. He has to understand Doc has so much confidence in him, and we all do. That basically seems to be where the message ended for the most part, other than Joel Embiid saying, this is why I love this city. Joel Embiid is the first 76er with at least 30 points, 15 boards, 10 assists in a game since Charles Barkley in 1989. As if we are just just overlooking the fact that your 7-foot center is giving you 10 apples and moving the, the basketball around and finding his teammates. That's so damn lethal. That's so damn special. And going back to some of your unavailable players to take the court tonight, you know, I do think it stinks that you're coming off of such a strong effort with Tyrese Maxey and and Joel Embiid together with some great play design to get 
Tyrese Maxey some open looks in the corner and drilling those threes. And then now you just have to take a step back because he's unavailable due to the health and safety protocols with absolutely stinks. You're still without your head coach. And speaking of Dan Burke, I think he does an excellent job in feeling out the rotations and the lineup. Something you're not seeing is the all bench. And uh, there was a time where, it, see, it goes back to what I said before when he coached the Brooklyn Nets game, which is, Sure, when Matisse Thibel is technically starting the game, but he's not really a full-time starter. He's sort of that hybrid. He can start when needed, but I don't truly look at him as one. You know, that plays a role today, of course, with the limited roster that you have, whether it's Furkan Korkmaz, or, I mean, we're talking about how much Tobias Harris has been awful. Uh, Seth Curry wasn't very good in the early stages of these games, so technically they're still out there on the floor, but it's not as if they're making an obnoxious impact and really taking this team to the next level with them being out there, but with Embiid playing all first quarter minutes and not take him, taking him out of the game prior. So when he does end up leaving the game, other guys are coming back on the floor. And then you have some starters out there. I do think that Dan Burke has done an excellent job in that department and definitely playing a role in, you know, just the feeling out process of this team. And um, I like it. I mean, I, I definitely like it. That's something we've been hard on Doc Rivers for for a while now, as we should be, because the all bench lineup is definitely not something that I think is extremely valuable when you can find ways to stagger your team, whether these players are playing to the best of their capability or not. There's something to be said about starting caliber players just being out there on the floor instead of an all-bench unit like we've seen under the Doc Rivers era for a bit of time now. I think that he's just more understanding of, of the lineup in general and and um, from putting, putting his fingerprints on, on it from that point, I thought, was... Noticeable, for sure, over the last two games. But, yeah, you know, I think that Tobias thing is going to steal the headlines, even though Joel Embiid has a triple-double, as if that's not remarkable in its own right. And it should, because it's clear that he's not playing well enough just to put a bow and a tie on exactly how I feel there, he can change this. It really just comes down to him. He's obviously lost a bit mentally because he's putting so much pressure on himself to dig him out of that hole. And there were moments in that second half where he gets a rebound. He gets a big offensive board. He's a couple feet from the basket. He hits a little jumper. He hits a little bit of a shot there. And, you know, just little things here and there. But it really comes down to him just finding ways to uh, take this pressure off of him that he's putting on himself and just go play basketball. You have to find ways to make it fun again. And I'm not going to make it seem like it's easy. The back end of my hockey career wasn't very fun and I'll tell you why. I wasn't playing and I wasn't playing well in practice and I put a lot of pressure on myself to say, you know, I, I emphasized every little detail, every little problem, every little mistake that I made because I knew the margin of error for me was so tiny. That's why I was an eighth defenseman, seven defenseman. Keep in mind, you only play six and you only dress six. So I'm a seventh defenseman, eighth defenseman. I'm trying to work my way in the lineup. When you're that low on yourself, it really is tough. But you're a professional athlete and that comes with this business and that's how you change things. It's not looking around saying, don't clap at me or egging on the fans. It's play better basketball. You play better basketball. All we are doing is feeling off of your vibe. When your vibe is good, our vibe is good. When your vibe is bad, our vibe is bad. So you you can change this. It's not out of your reach. It's not out of your fingertips. And there's another level in Tobias that isn't necessarily elite, special, unbelievable. Once again, the word serviceable is what I've been using. It's barely been that. So let's just get back to a a, a, a good Tobias Harris. Not a great, not a, like not anything wild. I'm just saying like a good Tobias Harris. I, I honestly don't even know if we've really seen it this year at all. And we're deep enough into the season now where I think it's fine and fair to have that nauseating type of moan when layups are being missed, bunnies are being missed, Poor decisions, like not even this isn't really a poor decision. It's just being unaware of the shot clock violation when the ball gets inbounded in. And maybe there was a play that was missed or a pass that was missed right before it ended up getting kicked out to Tobias by the three point line. But you got to be aware, and that sort of defines where he is upstairs in his brain, not fully thinking the game. Where else are we? 
Uh, when you think about Furkan Korkmaz, I haven't even mentioned the Furkinator yet. 24 points, 11 rebounds. Him and Isaiah Joe definitely stepped up and played a massive role in their success in scoring some points. Uh, Isaiah Joe, 18 points, 5 threes. He had billions and billions and billions of chances during the Furkan stretch of ugliness to make a name for himself and somewhat steal those minutes. Wasn't able to do it, and I just find it ironic that eventually he does. And when he does, it's the same night when Furkan kind of explodes, and Furkan did it in so many different ways, and by the way, he was grabbing some boards as well, working his ass off on the glass, which he recorded in double digits, 11 rebounds, which I just find hysterical, he's running the floor, and he's finger rolling as there's contact involved, and he played with a little bit of emotion, make it the the Houston Rockets, you know, take it, like the Houston Rockets is the team that ends up being the, the one that you need to play against if you're Furkan to get something going, but we've seen plenty of Furcon stretches before, there does seem to be a little bit of a trend where after a couple games where it starts going in the right direction, he lives in that range for a little bit of time. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a bit of a Furcon step in the right direction. And to be fair, as much as I can't stand the guy, and I think everybody overrates him when he makes some buckets and they think that he's something that he's not, he was better than what he put on display for the beginning stages of this season. Well, the beginning stages were actually smooth. It was after that when he fell into that black hole of disaster. I didn't think that's who he truly was. I don't think he's very good, but I don't think that that's truly who he was forever either. It's uh, There's another more. Uh, there's another step. There's a little more in there. Not anything overwhelming, to be fair. I just think we'll probably get a more confident Furcon for a bit of time. Maybe I'm wrong. Who knows? He could fall right back apart against Orlando on Wednesday. Let's see their schedule. They got Orlando on Wednesday in Orlando, according to the way I wrote it down, but I've made mistakes in the past. And then on Friday, it looks like they're home against the Spurs. So that's the rest of their week. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, a little every other action. We'll see if Furkan and Isaiah Joe too, not just Furkan, but Isaiah Joe, um, continues this little hot streak of stretching the floor. Now they're a, a, the fur con I'm watching defensively. Seth Curry, I watched defensively. Their perimeter play was just egregious. And, you know, with this Houston team, there's not much structure involved. Their tank is fascinating to watch from a distance. So they're not a team that is doing anything other than making a mess out there. You still got to play better defensively and get better in that perimeter department. And just in general, you allow 60-plus points to that slop. That's pretty brutal. But they put their foot on the gas and pretty much exploded when they needed to. And speaking of exploding, my wallet has been exploding because there's so much damn money in it. Why is there so much money in it? Because I've been utilizing WinView and I've been winning left and right. What is WinView? Ah, thank you for asking. WinView is the nation's leading sports predictor, allowing you to compete in pregame or live contest against other people. Not the house. You can answer questions about each game before it begins. There's weekend-long contests, quarter-long contests, and it's so much fun to take advantage of during the NFL season as the postseason is right upon us. NBA regular season, the NHL as well. So I'll give you some examples. Is Devontae Smith going to score a touchdown? Yes or no? Are the Eagles going to win this football game? Yes or no? You answer these type of questions. Don't worry about salary caps for daily fantasy. Don't worry about spreads or over-unders. You just answer questions about the game and if you are correct, you cash out. There's a, there's a link down below, the information, winview.tv slash broads. If you click that and sign up, You'd be a fool not to. Give it a shot. Give it a whirl. I'm addicted where I'm nonstop scrolling and I'm basically answering questions. There's free if you just want to try it out and play some free games or, excuse me, uh, answer questions about some free games early on just to get a feel of it and get a test. You can absolutely do that. And then once you realize, oh, damn, oh, man, am I going to make a lot of money doing it? Well, then you start throwing cash on it. Winview.tv slash broads. They have a deposit bonus right now that's being done. Doubled, a promo that is. If you spend 50, you'll get 100. If you spend 100, you'll get 200, which is the perfect promo to take advantage of during the NBA and NFL and NHL season. Winview.tv slash broach. Make sure you check it out. Before we run on over to the Anytime Hotline, I definitely want to touch on first real quick, Shake Milton falling on his back. That seemed like a scary sight, something just to monitor. 
because of Tyrese Maxey and some of these guys. I'm just saying, people are coming in and out of the lineup all throughout the league. COVID protocols, right? I mean, you're seeing teams that barely have their players even available for what it is. So it's been an absolute mess. You have someone who can clearly put the ball in his hands and who knows where he's at. It sounded the description of where he is with the the, the back being a little bit beat up there and barely able to turn. It doesn't seem good. And his reaction as he hit the floor was definitely one to be concerned about. So just something to monitor. And then lastly, Tom McGinnis and, and Mark Jackson on the call, I think they do a stellar job. And right now, you know, they bring in Kate Scott instead of moving forward with Mark Zumoff, of course, because he retired. And I miss Mark Zumoff so much. That's no shot on anybody else. It's just that's what I've grown up with my entire life is Mark Zumoff on the call. I, I just, look, they knew that Kate Scott had situations with college football, which was going to limit her, and we are already built to knowing what Tom McGinnis is like due to the radio call. I just don't know if the Sixers fully thought this through properly, where if Kate Scott isn't available and you like what she does so much, which is fine, and I respect that opinion because I do think that she is a professional in this craft, if you know she's going to miss time due to college football games and if there's COVID protocol stuff that's going on, as we know that players are missing it, people are going to miss game. Everything's going to happen in this bonkers world that we live in. To fill that void with somebody that we are all so connected with, I just think is a recipe for disaster. And it puts Kate Scott in an even tougher spot than she's already in, filling in for one of the greatest that we've ever heard in this city. I just don't know if they fully processed it as a whole. But yeah, I mean, I, I like Tom McGinnis and I like Mark Jackson on the call. I think they do a really good job together. I just don't know if they fully sat down and analyzed what does this mean? What does this sound like? What's the reaction going to be when? When you're trying something new with Kate Scott, when you had Mark Zuma for so long, and then you bring in someone that everybody already has this connection with, it's it's a tough way of doing business. It's not as if you can just throw anybody out there, right? I mean, I'm not saying I'm not acting as if there's a billion, but I, I'm sure if you sat down and fully processed, okay, this is where we're at. That's not my job, and I'm not in NBC Sports Philadelphia and analyzing where we're at here. But if that was, I would imagine that that's probably a better thing to do. Is okay. Let, let's let's really let this digest. And what does this mean for people watching the game and listening out there? Uh, it's just weird. It's just weird. But with that being said, let's rock some anytime hotline calls. I'm excited to hear from the people out there. Anytime hotline, here we go. What's up, bro? It's your boy T from South Philly. Yeah, um in the first half, I think uh we treated our coach like a substitute teacher and everybody just was going for what they wanted to do. But um Joel, you know, they say people say that um if people hit shots that, you know, he'd be good. And I guess people was hitting shots today. So, um, and plus I, I believe he trusted his players a little bit more. And, um, I would like him, I would like to see him like punish a small team like that though. But, um, at the end of the day, we did good. And I'm going to say it again, Tobias Harris is in his own head, man. I don't know what's going on with Tobias, man, but he forcing a lot of stuff. And, um, I remember last year, Doc said Tobias is good when he get, when he don't, when he make, don't make no decisions, when he just get the ball. And he just go and he just shoot or, or, or he make a move, one move. But he's, he's holding the ball. He's dribbling the ball. He, he's losing it right now, man. And Tobias is my man. But, um, and, and your boy Furkan, um, came through too. You be, you be killing Furkan. But, uh, yeah, we did good today, man. I'm glad that we got this win over this garbage team, man. And this is how we're supposed to do garbage teams, man. We're supposed to end these dudes 20. And this is what you was talking about when you were saying we got to beat these teams by like 20. You know, and um, Dave um, Burke, he did it. Doc, don't understand that. All right, bros. <laughs> yeah, Dan Burke. Dan Burke definitely has been nice uh, behind the bench or on the bench, I should say. What am I, a hockey player going behind the bench? No, on the bench, on the sidelines. I've been impressed with the last two outings that he stepped in for a role for Doc Rivers. But a few things you touched on. Why have I been hard on Furkan Korkmaz? Because he stinks. He's not a very good basketball player. So when you're not very good, I'm allowed to get on you, and he's just not very good. People overvalue him. So why do I get on Furkan? Because he stinks. Uh, but in terms of Toby, he's definitely in his in his own head, and no doubt about it. One of the things that Doc Rivers stressed so much in years past is just you see it and 
you take it, right? Don't overthink it. Don't double guess yourself. Don't overanalyze what the play is in that specific half court set or whatever the case may be. Just make the game simplify. Simplify the game and just take what is given to you. And now he's so focused on I'm not doing well. I'm not making shots. I'm missing bunnies that I think at times he's being irrational with some of his takes and he's not focusing enough or, you know, there's so many things just going on in his head all bouncing around in that brain of his that's definitely playing a role in the disastrous efforts that we've seen or the disastrous execution, I should say, from Toby. Now, you talk about Joel Embiid should be punishing these guys. Can we stop with that? My guy had 31, 15, and 10, and we're upset with him not punishing guys the, the way that you would like to. Oh, he's punishing them. Smaller guys bigger guy. I don't give a damn. He's punishing guys every single game. He's probably putting together one of the most impressive stretches of his entire career. I love you, T. I really do, but there's no reason to, to start really breaking down Joel Embiid as if he's not doing good enough because it doesn't look a certain way because he's dominating all bunch of opponents since pretty much getting through that COVID protocol scenario that that he went through and a couple of hiccups when he returned. Since then, he's been absolutely annihilating teams and crushing teams in so many ways. If you're one dimensional, and I'm not telling you it's easy to stop Joel and be with his back to the basket if he did that to you every single possession, but why is someone who is good at four or five things, why is that bad? Why is that worse than being good at one thing? He is annihilating players every game. I don't get why. And this is different than, well, why are you mad at the Sixers as a team if they win and it doesn't look a certain way compared to Joel Embiid? Because Joel Embiid's a damn MVP of this league, all right? He was a coin flip away from winning it last year. And I think it's pretty safe to say that he's the farthest thing from the issue with this team from an individual standpoint. And he's a monster and he's tearing apart opponents. I just don't get this obsession with Joel Embiid. Should only and by the way, he leads the league when it comes to playing with his back against the basket. When he plays back to the basket, because he does it way more than people actually give him credit for, which is also mind blowing. Is he trusting players more? No, it's just tonight players knock down their shots because I've seen him when when pressure was brought to them when players are bringing different looks to Joel Embiid. He kicks it out. The difference is Matisse Thibault's just missing shots. Shake Milton's just missing shots. Furkan's just missing shots. Isaiah Joe's just missing shots. He's not afraid to dish the rock around and find open teammates. Actually, it's been an area of one of his better skill sets this year is the way that he's been seeing the floor. Running the floor is what I even opened the show with in transition. So he's actually been really strong in that area. The difference is just the other side of it. When he does dish the rock, it's being executed a better way. He is averaging the most assists he has in his entire career. He's averaging... Hold on, this is the game log. More of a game log. I want to find the yearly statistics. He's averaging four assists per game. Where's he at? 2.8 2.8 last year, 3 the year before. And sure, Ben Simmons being on the floor compared to not being on the floor. Obviously, the ball, we're running with Joel Embiid more, so that makes sense. But it's not he's not trusting his teammates, and now he is. It's just knocking down shots definitely plays a role. What's next? I've been a big uh, fan of Tobias Harris for a couple of years now. But lately, I mean, I can't even recognize this guy anymore. I mean, the last couple of years, his bread and butter was the, um, you know, down low, post up, or he would do the uh, off the dribble elbow jumper. And I mean, he's just a shell of himself. I don't even see the elbow jumper anymore. Now it's just drive out of control and just kind of throw the ball for layups. I mean, oof, I, I hope he gets this again. I mean, I know he is what he is. He's not really a true number two, but he, he's got to be better than this. And I don't want to, I mean, Doc, I mean, you got to help him out with this. I mean, this is your guy from the Clippers. I mean, they had a good run, you know, the last couple of years with him. And now, I mean, well, we'll see. I mean, it's halfway there, you know, at the year. But ugh, we'll see if they can get his shit together.
Yeah, see, I don't know if this is a Doc problem anymore. Now there's Dan Burke, and Dan Burke isn't able to get to Tobias Harris, even though the message afterwards and talking to him at halftime, you know, they're trying everything that they can to somewhat smooth it down a bit because it's clearly as as intense as it's probably ever been from his angle and trying to get through this disastrous hump that he's going through right now. This is just a Tobias Harris issue at this point. You know, you can do only so much from a coaching level, but this player is just not there. Now, in games past, I gave him some credit for if you can't knock down your specific shots, just drive, get fouled, see the ball go through the hoop, but he's mixing that in too much with just awful takes and going out of control to the rack and just bad, ugly-looking layups and missed bunnies. I don't know what to do at this point. Now, you talk about him not being a number two. Oh, there's no doubt about it he's not a two. But he's not playing like a two, which he was last year, where we all yelled that he should have been an all-star. He's not playing like a number three. Hell, he's not playing like a number four. He's playing like a bench player. He really is. That's where he's at at this point. And that's just totally unacceptable. He's a bench guy. And I don't even know if it's even at the top of bench players right now. So that's why we're on him as much as we're on him. And I think he needs to realize that. We all have times where we just crack. And maybe that's an eye-opening experience for him. You know, I'm sure this is probably one of the most intense versions of adversity that has ever hit someone like Tobias Harris. So maybe this is sort of a wake-up call where, you know, you just realize when he's self-assessing tonight, when he's laying in bed and he's thinking about the game, when he's watching film, when he sees his reaction, he goes, that's not me. I'm out of character right now. And I'll I'll tie back as as we kind of end the show here on something that I went through too with hockey, and that is kind of dating back to the same scenario. When you're in such a really, really low point in in your life there, which I was at one point towards the end of my hockey career, I realized that the locker room didn't even know who I was. The broads, the goofy guy, the guy that danced in the locker room, the guy that, you know, I was the, the, the funny guy in the showers that would dance after practice, right? They didn't really get to experience that because I was in my own head and I realized my personality wasn't even showing and I had to self-assess and realize that's not me and something really needs to change and I have to do this because it isn't going to happen in any other way where I just need to approach every day with a smile and approach every day with this new sense of urgency, with a new sense of life, with a new sense of appreciation for what I'm doing and just hope that that eventually snowballs into me just enjoying what I'm doing again and then there's a big domino effect on the confidence that you have and able to do it and yeah you know I just think that he needs to self-assess and go this isn't me right now that moment that I had on the court that's not Tobias Harris and hopefully he needed that to kind of spark something new for Toby maybe I'm being naive I'm just looking at answers how can this change how can something new happen well I think that has to happen and until Tobias Harris has that light bulb moment you know there's nothing else that other people can do other than maybe if someone else shows him the light and shows him the water that he has to drink if you will, for him to see that perspective. But we'll know with time, that's for sure. And with that being said, we're gonna we're gonna end it here. I do need to tell you D Simone Jewelers is the best ever. And I truly do mean that. I went to them for my fiance's engagement ring and the face that she had when I went down on one knee. And trust me, it wasn't because holy shit, I'm stuck with this goofball. No, no, no. It was the size of the rock. And by the way, if you knew what I paid for that, you'd be like, damn, I need to go to G- D Simone Jewelers right now. They're a family owned business located in Haddonfield, New Jersey, previously in Jewelers Row. Will, Lou, Nick, and Mike, they'll take care of you. When you walk in there, you're not just a customer. You are part of the D. Simone family. They work with you to get the best design at the most reasonable price you will find in the market. They provide custom jewelry design, jewelry repairs, appraisals, watch repairs, diamond setting, jewelry cleaning, and so much more. I had a buddy actually get an engagement ring somewhere else, and I said, yo, dude, go to where I went, D. Simone Jewelers. He returned it took a hit financially because he knew how much he was going to be spending at D. Simone for a nice-sized rock, a nice-sized diamond. It's night and day from when you when you step into their building and when you go anybody, go anywhere else to anybody else when you're looking for some nice jewelry for your significant other. D. Simone Jewelers, they will hook you up if you walk in there and say, Bro sent you. Their website is in the description, dsimonejewelers.com. With that being said, I want to thank everybody so much for hanging out with me today and I. I will see you next time.